Clothes are the ultimate form of visual communication. By looking at the way people dressed, we can learn not only about them as individuals, but about the society they lived in. I'm Amber Butchart, fashion historian, and in the words of Louis XIV, I believe that fashion is the mirror of history. So, taking historical works of art as our inspiration, Traditional tailor Ninia Michaela and her team will be recreating historical clothing using only authentic methods. Oh, look at that, it's changing colour in the air. And I'll be finding out what they tell us about the people who wore them. I'm assuming the king wouldn't be dressing himself though, right? And the times they lived in. And Ooh. seeing what they're like to wear. The picture that launched a thousand theories, Jan van Eyck's famous double portrait painted in 1434, is considered one of the most complex paintings in Western art. I chose this portrait for a number of reasons. It's something that has been written about extensively in art history. There's a real appetite for new information that can shed light on this portrait and the sitters. Now, historically speaking, it's also a very fascinating period. We've seen the emergence of mercantile capitalism all around port cities in Europe. So we begin to see the effects of trade really heavily on the way that people are dressing. Now, also the emergence of the merchant. This is quite an interesting character. They challenge the previous very rigid structures of society. So there's an element of social mobility here. You can become very rich through trade. You don't necessarily have to have been born into wealth. And I'm really interested to see if this element of social mobility is reflected in the way that people are dressing. So there are a number of things going on with this portrait. Plus, I really love the colour green. This dress is so alien to our modern aesthetic. I'm really interested to find out from Ninja just how complicated it will be to make. I suppose the thing that strikes you first is just quite how much fabric there is in there. And then as you zoom in, you see these huge hanging sleeves, which have the most incredible decoration going on at the bottom of them. What you're seeing there is literally layers of the fabric, which have been cut with a special tool, a pinking tool, to give that very fragile, frayed look. And so the fabric itself, this gorgeous green fabric, what is this? What, what material is it? It was a kind of cloth that was woven very wide, so it was called broadcloth. This fabric today is usually called doe skin or superfine. But what these very small samples don't really show is how beautiful that looks in the picture. And that's because you need a larger piece of the fabric. So this is a piece of doe skin. So you can see that once it starts to drape and actually get oh, the yeah. light on it, it becomes a much more silky looking material. Yeah. People don't usually associate wool as being a luxury fabric, do they? They don't. And at this date, it really was one of England's finest exports and it was bought and used all over Europe. But it's not just the wool that we're seeing uh, here, is it? There's this fur trim as well. Now, where does this fur in particular come from? We're still thinking about what it might be. And one possibility is it might be um, an Arctic fox. Wow. Where does one get hold of Arctic fox? Well, for these people, it would have been imported. It would be Baltic. It's another expensive luxury item. And that's quite helpful in an age before central heating, isn't it? It would be really keep you warm. Yes. Wool and fur. Now, we're not going to be using any Arctic fox, I'm assuming, for no. this. So what will we be using? We'll be looking for a faux fur. So really throughout here, we're seeing quite a, an opulent display of wealth. Here. This literally wearing your wealth on your sleeves. Yeah, and trailing it on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Given that this dress seems to be such a conspicuous display of wealth, I'm fascinated to find out more about the couple in the portrait and why they might have chosen these clothes to be painted in. I'm hoping art historian Jenny Graham can shed some light on the subject. So this portrait, one of the most contested, most debated in the history of Western art, who do we think these people are? They're a very wealthy couple. We know that they come from the Arnolfini family, 
who traded in luxurious fabrics and exotic items such as the four oranges that you can see. This really represents their conspicuous consumption of wealth and splendid things. Now, this picture has become ensconced within popular culture. Even Charles Dickens refers to it as that strange mirror picture. Why do you think it's got such an enduring appeal? I can't think of another painting in sort of Western art history whereby we know so very much about how it's been interpreted in different ways over the years. It seems to be a painting which triggers all kinds of detective-like uh, attempts to solve the enigma, the riddle. One of the overriding theories that's now been discredited is that she's pregnant, but that's not the case, is it? No, the pregnancy theories first crop up in the 19th century, but a modern reading of the painting is very much that she is holding up the green wool dress, very, very heavy. And so the painting now is much more understood, I think, as a display of opulence and wealth. And it's more than that as well. It's very, very interesting in terms of gender politics. If she were to let go of the folds of the dress, it would pull out all around her in a way that would make it almost impossible to walk. And we know, for example, that there were lots of ways that women in this, at this time signalled their social status, the fact that they weren't going to be moving around or undertaking anything manual. Everything seems to signal restraint. So the dress we're seeing here represents a number of different things. It can speak to us about the position of women in society. It can speak to us about the couple, the status as merchants. So it really, there's an awful lot going on here, isn't there? Yes, I mean, interestingly, the green dress is made of wool, which was very much associated with trade between Bruges, where Jan van Eyck paints the portrait, and Italy. We know that the Arnolfini family traded in cloth particularly, so there's a sort of familial significance there. But green itself was a colour associated with high finance and banking. When one made a trade in um, Italy during this period, one would place down a green cloth. So I think there's a real significance given the trade in which they've made their money. Just as the painting's complexity provides continual debate for art historians, so the dress's design is proving a challenge for Ninja. I'm trying to work out how the sleeves on this Arnolfini gown actually work because they're incredibly complicated. If you go to the bottom of the strips, mm -hmm. see, look, isn't that the bottom edge of a strip? And that's the bottom edge oh, of a yeah. strip. So That's it's in, like there's layers. It's in tears, isn't it? It's got a sort of fold at the bottom, hasn't it? Oh, Do that's the point. Maybe it's not a raw edge. Maybe it's folded. I don't think that is a raw edge. Look, it doesn't... It's not pinked, the edge. The edge is, is definitely different. That's not a pinked edge. That's a fold. How about it's one piece that's really long and it's folded up behind itself and pinned... So that the, so it's behaving. The, the long things would come down to there and then fold mm -hmm. back up. Yeah, and that would give it more body, so it would stay... It would give it, it that sort of flat front thing. I think that's worth a shot. <laughs> Need to do another twirl in something thicker. Yeah, how about if I cut it in wool and then we can cut mm -hmm. into it and see yes. how it behaves? Yes, it'll have more body, won't it? All Twice right. as big. Back to the drawing board. <laughs> <laughs> As we've seen, everything about this portrait screams status. Just the sheer amount of fabric in the gown could have caused offence at a time when strict sumptuary laws dictated what different classes of society could wear. As merchants, the Arnolfinis may have been rich, but they weren't nobility, and their ostentatious display of wealth was at odds with the rigid hierarchical society of the time. In Flanders, where they lived, one chronicler even blamed the outbreak of civil war just over 50 years earlier on the audacity of city dwellers who were better dressed than the nobles. And this attitude wasn't confined to Europe. In England, Geoffrey Chaucer wrote, May not a man see us in our days the sinful, costly array of clothing, and namely in too much superfluity that maketh it so dear to the harm of the people, but there is also the costly furring in their gowns, 
so much pouncing of chisel to make holes, so much dagging of shears, with a superfluity in length of the aforesaid gowns, trailing in the dung and in the mire. Wool was the primary fabric for clothing in the Middle Ages, but quality varied depending on whether it was for a peasant or a prince. English wools in particular were considered to be very high quality, and some could even be more expensive than silk. Our gown would have been made from the highest quality broadcloth, nowadays called doeskin. To find out more about the processes involved in making this fabric, I'm visiting a company that has been making doeskin for over 200 years. So you've got a bale this size, that when you unroll it, it'll actually oh my expand God. to this. <laughs> wow. After arriving in tightly compacted bales, the wool is pulled apart and aerated in the blending process. So this is what it looks like when it comes off the, out of the machine. Yeah. So you can see how different it looks, how, how aerated and how pulled apart it is. Next, the aerated wool is sent to carding. This machine is going to take all of this yeah. to make it look like this. OK, and how does it do that? Carding is where the wool fibres are broken up and are lined into strands. That really does look like clouds or something. You can really see it starting yeah. to take that shape now. This is what you get out wow. at the end. So this is what we call slubbing. If you pull it apart, you can see that there's no strength in there, but you can take the same piece and put all those twists in and turn it and turn it and turn it and then try and pull it apart. You can see that you've got more strength in there. So that's yeah. the spinning process that we have to go through next to make it into the yarn that we can put through. The yarn is spun onto spools and then woven into cloth. The next process is what makes our wool so special. It's washed and beaten, which shrinks the cloth, meshing the fibres together, giving it its felt-like texture and enabling it to be cut without fraying. Then, tentering. So you know the saying tender hooks? Yes. Being kept on tender hooks, that's where this saying comes from. It would have been carried out into a field, it would have been pinned actually onto wooden A-frames and left out into the sun to dry. Yeah. Obviously, it would have taken a very long time and therefore being kept on tender hooks. Oh. But this is the modern day equivalent. So, you see these holes? Yeah. That's where your tender hooks are. Ah! Oh. Wow. <laughs> so this is your dough skin. Oh my God, so this uh, is it. So beautiful. Look I know. The colour. It's the sheen. Oh. It's the face of the fabric that gives it that beautiful, beautiful sheen. How exciting. I can't wait to see it made up. It's just incredible how many different stages this fabric has gone through to get it into this beautiful finished state. And it's even more astounding to think that in the 15th century, each of these different stages would have actually been done by hand. It really goes to show just how expensive this fabric would have been. It was a real status symbol and a real show of wealth. Come and see how gorgeous it looks. Oh, wow. It could just make you cry, it's so beautiful. That <laughs> is gorgeous. Look at it. It's like liquid, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's just what we wanted. It's, oh, it's so perfect. And amazing. I did have to think quite carefully about how to cut such a wide pattern piece from the wool. And it, it had to have pieces, extra pieces sewn into it. So we've got those pieces at the sides here. Oh, wow. And you can see how where they're upside down, the light falls completely differently yeah. on it. And nowadays, that's something we wouldn't find acceptable at yeah. all. Yeah. But of course, you know, in the gown, you just, you just don't see it with the way it falls. Yeah, it just gets lost in the, in the pleats and the folds. The, the real complex features of this gown are not there yet. So we've got the pinking in the sleeves and also there's all this very tight pleating in the front and back, I suspect, of the gown. I've done quite a lot of samples of the pinking because it's quite scary to go, you know, you can only cut once. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So I've done one strip here. Oh. It's quite effective, isn't it? It's really effective. 
So exciting. It is exciting. Yeah. It's all, you know, it's all such experimental archaeology. It's brilliant. Yeah. You, know, you, don't, you don't make these things all the time and you can't possibly know all of the answers without just doing it, which is what we're doing. Would you like to have a go? <laughs> OK, yes, yes, I would. Sound like it might not have been hard enough. <laughs> I don't think I feel like it wasn't hard enough. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yay! Yeah, that works. <laughs> I think what this also really illustrates is it's the nature of the cloth that allows you to do this kind of technique and it and it not fray. And it not yeah, fray and fall just apart. Because... That. Yay. Mm -hmm. To the end. <laughs> okay. Oh, look at you that. start to get a real feel for how delicate and yet how complex it looks, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. And then Harriet is working on a very exciting piece. This, and this really is it's so, it's it so is exciting. exciting. It doesn't look so exciting, but a drab linen. You know, one of the features of these gowns is the way they've got all these pleats mm. in, in the middle. We know from having tried to make these reconstructions in the past that you, you can almost achieve that look. And then as soon as the person moves, all the pleats move and we've experimented with things like stay tapes and sewing the insides and nothing's ever been quite as effective as we want it to be yeah linen especially a sort of a rough canvassy linen like this has it's got a lot more control stiff. about it yeah. yeah what we're doing is just lightly stitching the linen down onto the wool we don't credit tailors this early with um, mm. such ingenuity and um, it's slightly embarrassing when you discover these technologies and you think they yeah. knew a lot more than we did. <laughs> they knew their fabrics really well. Really knew That's the fabric. The it's incredible the number of different techniques mm. that go into it. I haven't yeah. even got to the fur yet. There's quite a lot of it. <laughs> Whoa. And it's heavy. Oh my gosh. In fact, this is something I hadn't really considered is just how heavy this whole thing is going to be. Yeah. Because this yeah. fur on its own, if you lift that, and see how heavy it is, and then we've got the wool on the top. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> so is this, the full amount of this is going to go into the dress? Yeah, because we've decided that the whole of those big sleeves must be lined in yeah. fur, and then most of this gown, which is probably why she's standing there like this. <laughs> <laughs> she's just going, get, sad, get like it off me. <laughs> Dyeing was perhaps the most important of the finishing processes to give woolen cloth its final appearance. Blue dye had been common since the 14th century and even peasants were likely to own a coloured gown. Deep shades, like those in our portrait though, were still hard to achieve. The colours in the Arnolfini picture are really important. We've got this real richness to the colours and I think that it's all kind of bound up with the wealth and the status that's really on display in this picture. So I'm really keen to see if we can replicate those colours using the techniques that would have been around in the 15th century. I think it's going to be a really interesting experiment to find out. Debbie Bamford specialises in traditional dyeing techniques. So how common was green as a colour in the 15th century? Not as common. Green is a much more expensive colour because it's two dyes. It's the yellow and the blue. The yellow dye is made from a plant called weld, or dyer's rocket, which is dried and broken up. If you'd like to take a string and tie that tightly round for me. Like this? Yes. So this goes in here. That just goes in there. Yeah. Just you just, just drop it in. Anything happening? No. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. look. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Now, the crucial bit. Well responds very, very well to the addition of a little glug of this. So uh, hold okay. your nose. <laughs> Could you explain? I have a feeling yeah. that I might know what this is. Could you explain to me what this is? This is stale urine. This is minimum three week old urine and I'm using it to modify the colour. Okay. So you can see this pale yellow there. Yeah. If I pour some of this in, this isn't giving the colour, it is now drawing the colour out of the line. Can you oh see gosh, how much that makes so much difference. Yeah. So if I put that in there with that now, you can see the yellow 
much more clearly on the cloth. Yeah. Now that's got to be heated up for a while, for about a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. and that should then start developing the colour. For blue, another plant called woad is used, which is dried and made into balls for storage. We have to dissolve it in an alkali, right. so that's where the stale urine came in. And so the dye vat is actually made up with stale urine and the woad mess. It's kind of a dyer's best friend, Absolutely. really, stale yeah. urine, isn't it? Yes. So we take the yellow piece out now. Ooh, OK. Look at that. That's really, really lovely colour. That's really quite a busy, vivid yellow, That's isn't it? lovely. That's one of my favourite colours. You want to put it, just slide it in very carefully. Ooh, you like the smell of that one, don't you? <laughs> And that really just smells unpleasant, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the more times it's gone back in the dye bath, the more expensive the colour gets. Right. If you want a dark green, you're going to go in two or three times. Mm -hmm. If you want a green like you're wearing, or like we're talking in the, this particular painting, then yes, that is, I've got some status and I've got some wealth. That's so interesting. I didn't realise that the strength of the colour sort of determined the price. I mean, it mm. makes perfect sense. Do you want to take the yellow out of the blue? Yeah, yes. so this, we're hoping that this we're is, going to, this is going to be our green. green. Yeah, OK. Oh, my God. God. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so horrible. It looks gorgeous. Oh, look at that. It's changing colour in the air. It's pretty much getting to the same colour as my top. I did not realise that it had that kind of reaction to the air. That's it's really exciting yeah, that it moment, is. isn't it? Yeah. That is an amazing colour. That's gorgeous, isn't it's it? It's a beautiful green, isn't it? And you can see how that is getting you the colour for the Arnolfini. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. I think if it wasn't for the smell, <laughs> I would have been very happy being a medieval tire. <laughs>
so soft in here. Well, yeah. Oh <laughs> my god. Oh look at that. That's oh, the you sleeves. Up. The sleeves are just amazing. When they move they're even better. They are, it's great seeing them moving. <laughs> it looks so much like the painting. <laughs> I can't get over this. It's just incredible. And it's so heavy. It feels insanely luxurious. Does it? Really That's luxurious. Good. So it, can you actually walk, do you think? If you grab a handful of the stuff so that you can actually not tread, that's it. Oh, it's very elegant. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> That's really exciting. And it gives you that stance that yeah. she has in the painting as well, doesn't it? Which is really interesting. Maybe part of that stance is to do with the weight of the fabric. It, Balancing yeah. it. Yeah. That's, that's being held. It's, you know, you have to kind of lean back to be able to get purchase on the, yeah. on the weight of the fabric. <laughs> well, it's a constant reminder of your wealth, yeah. isn't it? This is so heavy. I've got so much money. That's yeah. good. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the sleeves are just absolutely phenomenal. It didn't occur to me that they would... Make you want to do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> that they would be so kind of fluid. It's that sort of fluidity that the whole thing has. But that's what you just can't get from a portrait. In a portrait, as a maker, you always want to say, could you just lift your arm? Could you just do that? <laughs> yeah. and, and then you would see what was going on, and we yeah. can't do that. With... Yeah, it really gives it life, doesn't it, to yeah. have a real human person in it. <laughs> and not too hot? I mean, it's, it's quite hot. <laughs> Definitely. The thing is, at this period in the 15th century, it's basically what the period that's known as the mini ice ages. This is a time when the River Thames regularly froze thick enough that you could have whole frost fairs frost on fairs. it. It makes a lot more sense when you take away central heating and reduce yeah. the temperature outside by a few degrees. Yeah. A lot of and heat being you generated. are a lady of leisure. If you're a labouring woman, you would keep a lot warmer, but you're spending a lot of your time just sitting or standing, and so you would definitely need these kinds of layers. Yeah, and swishing. And swishing. I would just obviously. spend all my time swishing. If you needed swishing. to warm up any more, you just do a bit of swishing and then <laughs> yeah. sit down again. <laughs> yeah. It's just fantastic. This experiment has been really fascinating. What surprised me about seeing the gown, I think, is really how bulky it is, how much fabric and how much fur there is. It must have cost an absolute fortune. This idea of wealth and status is really rammed home. She really becomes a symbol of these new types of wealth, these new types of people who are buying and selling, who are trading at this time. It also is incredibly fascinating in terms of the female body ideal as well that was prevalent in the 15th century. So having an idea and understanding of what this feels like to create this is, is just invaluable.